Good evening. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of all my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching this evening's program online, as well as those of you who are here with us in person. To open, I humbly start with a land acknowledgement to recognize that the land on which we stand was once stewarded by indigenous peoples. And while land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important way to promote indigenous visibility, and it serves as a reminder that we are on stolen and settled indigenous land. And I invite all of us to contemplate how to better support indigenous communities and learn how to honor and take care of the land that each of us inhabits. I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and AT&T, and our media sponsor, the Boston Globe. I would also like to thank Ellen Fitzpatrick, Professor of History at the University of New Hampshire for her advice as we developed tonight's program. We're so pleased to welcome all of you this evening and hope that you'll be able to, to do so often. Uh, this summer, for the first time ever, we will be opening our museum for four special free late night evenings. We hope you can join us next Wednesday, June 21st, for our first late night, which will include a fun quiz night no team or experience needed with lots of presidential tales and some clues from our own museum galleries. Full information for this late night series is available on our website if you are interested. And this evening, we thank you for silencing your cell phones. Jonathan Eig has kindly agreed to sign copies of King, A Life after tonight's program. Our bookstore will be selling copies if you are interested. We also look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. When the Q&A starts, we will invite those of you who are joining us in person to proceed to the microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. As we commemorate the 60th anniversary of President Kennedy's landmark June 11th, 1963 speech, in which he called the civil rights crisis a moral issue, as well as a constitutional and legal one, and announced that he would be submitting civil rights legislation to Congress, we are so grateful to have this opportunity to explore civil rights in the 1960s and today. I'm now delighted to introduce tonight's speakers. I'm pleased to extend a warm welcome to the Kennedy Library to Jonathan Eig. A former senior writer for the Wall Street Journal, he is the New York Times bestselling author of several books, including Ali, A Life, Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig, and Opening Day, the story of Jackie Robinson's first season. Ken Burns called him a master storyteller. His new book is the biography King, a life. I'm glad to welcome Judge Nancy Gertner, retired, back to the library, a senior lecturer of law at Harvard Law School and a former federal judge. She was appointed to the bench in 1994 by President Clinton. She has written and spoken widely on various legal issues concerning civil rights, civil liberties, criminal justice, and procedural issues throughout the United States and the world, and has received numerous awards throughout her distinguished, distinguished career. It is also a pleasure to welcome David Greenberg this evening, a professor of history and of journalism and media studies at Rutgers University, and a frequent commentator in the national news media on contemporary politics and public affairs. His most recent book is Republic of Spin, an inside story of the American presidency. Formerly a full-time journalist, Professor Greenberg is now a contributing editor to Politico magazine, where he writes a regular column. I'm delighted to welcome Tracy Parker, Associate Professor of African American Studies at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, to the library this evening, the author of Department Stores and the Black Freedom Movement, Workers, Consumers, and Civil Rights. She is currently working on her second book, 
beyond loving black love, sex, and marriage in the 20th century. Her research has received support from the Woodrow Wilson and Mellon Foundations and the National Endowment for the Humanities, among others. I'm also pleased to welcome Mark Whitaker, our moderator for this evening's conversation, to the library. He currently serves as a CBS Sunday Morning contributing correspondent. He spent three decades as a reporter, writer, and editor for Newsweek magazine, rising to become the first African American to lead a national news weekly. He then shifted to TV news, replacing the late Tim Russert as Washington bureau chief of NBC News, and serving as worldwide managing editor for CNN. His most recent book is Saying It Loud, 1966, The Year Black Power Challenged the Civil Rights Movement. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. This is not a sectional issue. Difficulties over segregation and discrimination exist in every city, in every state of the Union, producing in many cities a rising tide of discontent that threatens the public safety. Nor is this a partisan issue. In a time of domestic crisis, men of goodwill and generosity should be able to unite regardless of party or politics. This is not even a legal or legislative issue alone. It is better to settle these matters in the courts than on the streets, and new laws are needed at every level. But law alone cannot make men see right. We are confronted primarily with a moral issue. It is as old as the scriptures and is as clear as the American Constitution. The heart of the question is whether all Americans are to be afforded equal rights and equal opportunities, whether we are going to treat our fellow Americans as we want to be treated. If an American, because his skin is dark, cannot eat lunch in a restaurant open to the public, if he cannot send his children to the best public school available, if he cannot vote for the public officials who represent him, if in short he cannot enjoy the full and free life which all of us want, then who among us would be content to have the color of his skin changed and stand in his place? Who among us would then be content with the counsels of patience and delay? One hundred years of delay have passed since President Lincoln freed the slaves, yet their heirs, their grandsons, are not fully free. They are not yet freed from the bonds of injustice. They are not yet, not yet freed from social and economic oppression. And this nation, for all its hopes and all its boasts, will not be fully free until all its citizens are free. We preach freedom around the world, and we mean it. And we cherish our freedom here at home. But are we to say to the world, and much more importantly, to each other, that this is a land of the free, except for the Negroes, that we have no second-class citizens except Negroes, that we have no class or caste system, no ghettos, no master race, except with respect to Negroes. Now the time has come for this nation to fulfill its promise. The events in Birmingham and elsewhere have so increased the cries for equality that no city or state or legislative body can prudently choose to ignore them. The fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south, where legal remedies are not at hand. Redress is sought in the streets, in demonstrations, parades, and protests, which create tensions and threaten violence and threaten lives. We face, therefore, a moral crisis as a country and a people. It cannot be met by repressive police action. It cannot be left to increase demonstrations in the streets. It cannot be quieted by token moves or talk 
It is a time to act in the Congress, in your state and local legislative body, and above all, in all of our daily lives. Now on the Wow. <laughs> We kind of we kind of we kind of miss that in presidential <laughs> addresses these days. So, David, you actually wrote about this speech in one of your books called "Republic of Spin." So, could you tell us a little bit how did it come about and uh, and what kind of impact did it have in real time? Right. So, so there's the immediate writing of the speech, which is what I dealt with in "Republic of Spin," and then there's sort of what prompted it, which I'll talk about for a moment first. I mean, he, you heard him say in the speech the events in Birmingham, and I think here everyone's familiar with. Uh, Martin Luther King and the, uh, camp, the Birmingham campaign to desegregate that city that led to such horrific images of water hoses and, and police dogs attacking innocent protesters that helped galvanize the nation. Kennedy also said something about other cities and discontent. And a part people sometimes forget about this story is that after Birmingham, cities all around the country sort of erupt in these mini Birminghams. Uh, I've been writing about Nashville because John Lewis, who's the subject of my next book, was there. And that's really when Nashville fully gets desegregated too. But all around the country, there's these protests, some turn violent. And so it's not just Birmingham. People talk about it as the Birmingham Bill or the Bull Connor Bill, but it's also these secondary uh, cities. Then finally, the very day of the speech is when George Wallace is standing in the schoolhouse door to try to prevent the desegregation okay. of uh, the University of Alabama. And Bobby Kennedy has sent down um, uh, a Justice Department um, official to sort of challenge him and eventually proceed with that. And during the day, as all of this is going down, Ted Sorensen sort of pokes in his head to the president and says, maybe we should give that speech now. In other words, Kennedy had decided it was finally time to introduce the Civil Rights Bill that he'd been sitting on for so long because it was just politically risky and inopportune, but it was when was going to be the moment. And it was finally the, the events at the University of Alabama that say, okay, now is the time. So the speech, it's a little bit hasty. It's not fully even scripted. Parts of it are scripted. Parts are from notes. You can see him. He's not reading off a teleprompter. He's looking down at his notes uh, because he's kind of not quite cobbling it together on the fly, but it's not a fully uh, written out address when he delivers it. You wouldn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Nancy, you were uh, in high school at this time, or what, what you would have uh, been? Uh, just about graduating. High school, yeah. Right, and so you go to Barnard College, and then you embark on a career as a civil rights attorney. Right. Before you eventually became a judge. So how much did, did the Kennedy, well, this, this whole era of it, particularly the Kennedy, uh, President Kennedy, and what he stood for, factor into your, your choices to go into that field? To some degree, uh, the best way to describe it is to describe, you know, you, you're never conscious even when you're uh, you know, graduating college, you're not conscious of the influences on you necessarily. When Kennedy died, uh, School Barnard shut down. We were all uh, glued to the television and completely bereft. I mean, really hy hysterically crying. And when we, Barnard reopened, my, my freshman college professor just had everyone in the room saying, I understand, she said, this is the first politician that you fell in love with. And that was absolutely true. Um, and the, I mean, one was what his leadership meant to all of us as a model of a life. And then the other thing was, it was impossible, at least impossible for me, maybe others were able to do this, to, to carve out a life when the Vietnam War was raging and there were demonstrations in the streets when the South was, was on fire in so many ways, and the women's rights movement. I mean, it was, um, I like to say my first year at Yale Law School, I was uh, demonstrating more than I was in class, as I recall. But um, no, I mean, it completely, uh, it, in, in, it, I thought I wanted to be only an academic, and I could not stay in the library. <laughs> and my life really changed because of all of of this, but it was a uh, 
I just couldn't stay in the library any longer. So John, in your, in your great new book, um, you, well, President Kennedy talks about this as a moral issue. And obviously, it was a moral issue for Dr. King, too, in the streets of Birmingham, in the jails of Birmingham. But as you write in your book, there was also political calculation involved. There was, was, there was media theater involved. So could you talk about what the mix of all of that was on both sides? Yeah, I smiled when, when he called it a moral issue, uh, because that's what Dr. King was trying to get through. Mm -hmm. And just for a little context, um, it's worth remembering that Martin Luther King is, first of all, he's watching that speech at the home of one of his friends in Birmingham um, in his pajamas. And, and, and the daughter, uh, who I interviewed, of the person he was staying with, said he was crying at the end of that speech. Uh, because King is 12 years younger than JFK. He's 34 years old at the time of that speech. And he had not seen himself going into this kind of a career. He wanted to be a preacher for a few years and then become a college professor. He's thrown into this movement. Um, he's thrown into this struggle because he happens to be in Montgomery at the time of the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955-56. And suddenly, after the success of the Montgomery bus boycott, this becomes a moral and a political issue. And there are people all over the country who see the potential for King to help spread this, as you said, David, spread it to places that we don't even think about, where all of these fires are burning, all of these protests are arising. And King, wherever he comes, becomes the, the eye of the storm. He's able to focus more attention. And it's King who is perhaps more than, I say almost certainly more than anyone, who's able to take these fires that are burning and bring them to the level, add enough heat to them that, they, that the president and others can no longer ignore them. And King is shouting out, in part because he's not a political beast, he doesn't care for politics, he doesn't really have that, that ego or any of the other tools that are required to play politics, he is trying to convince these political people that these are moral issues and that that should matter. And he's deeply frustrated with President Kennedy for the longest time because Kennedy is balancing the moral issues and the politics and deciding it's not time yet. I'm going to lose too many votes right now among whites in the South if I do this. And, and King's job is to, is to turn up the heat until Kennedy feels like he can't ignore it anymore, and, and it's worth maybe losing some votes. And that's the tension. And there's a lot of tension between the two men. King is not happy with Kennedy, really, until that moment, until that television broadcast. And, and it's, um, it's a deeply frustrating experience for him. So people may know this story, but you know, you, you, your <clears throat> portrait of Coretta King, Dr. King's wife, is excellent in your book. So could you just remind people of the role that she played in the relationship between Kennedy and, and Coretta King in, in all of this? Yeah, we often relegate not just Coretta, but many women to the background of history, that they're the, 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 the woman behind the, the, the man. And that's just really wrong so often, and especially wrong in Coretta's case, because she was more accomplished as an activist than he was at the time they met. And the big thing that attracted Martin Luther King Jr. to Coretta was the fact that she had been this powerful activist on campus at Antioch, and she was pushing him all the way to think more aggressively about what he could do with his, with his own education, with his own pulpit, with his leadership. And um, it's, it's not a coincidence that it's Coretta who gets on the phone with President Kennedy um, when King's in jail and Kennedy's calling to offer his support. Um, uh, a phone call that some people believe turned the election. And it's Coretta who's talking to the press and is telling the reporters about her conversation. She is not afraid to be out there. Um, and in fact, King is g giving her messages from jail saying, have you called this person yet? Have you called that person yet? Have you told them about the phone call from President Kennedy? And she's on it already. I've done all that. Um, it's a really fascinating relationship. And then, made all the more fascinating by the fact that King has this terrible blind spot when it comes to women in positions of leadership and doesn't give Coretta as much responsibility as she would like. Yeah. So Tracy, you know, so much of the history of this period focuses on the prominent black leaders like Dr. King and others, or President Johnson, later President Kennedy. But, but you, your scholarship focuses on ordinary people and the role that they've played in history. So could you talk about the people who are actually out there doing oh, the protesting? Sure. No, I mean, Diane Nash says it correctly that the civil rights movement is a people's movement, right? right? That this is many thousands of people who have risked their lives, their livelihood, to try to end Jim Crow. Um, and it's, you need this mass group of people, right, to do the legwork. 
to do the community organizing, that this organizing is happening before King gets there and long after he leaves. Right, so the Montgomery bus boycott is a great example. Right? This starts in 1955. We think immediately when we think of Montgomery bus boycott of Rosa Parks and Dr. Martin Luther King. But we know that women, particularly on the ground in Montgomery, had been doing this work of trying to integrate the bus system. Not only the bus system, but also the work of being a bus driver at the time in 55. Um, it's the people of Montgomery who boycott the bus system for 13 months. Right? Walking to and from work, many of these people being black domestic women who were doing this work to ensure that this protest is successful. We can jump ahead to Birmingham in 1963, right? We know that Kennedy is thinking in April a major civil rights bill won't be successful. And by May 10th, he's thinking something very different, right? And he's thinking it differently because you have the Children's Crusade in May of 63. Right? You've got thousands, I mean hundreds of thousands of children, elementary age, high school children, who decide to cut school on these days and protest in the street in Birmingham. And they're physically assaulted, I mean brutally assaulted. We see the images of the fire hoses and the dogs that are sicked on them. Um, this not only changes the public consciousness, but it also changes Kennedy's view about what he can do as president when it comes to a civil rights bill. And the civil rights bill becomes so expansive in a way that it almost maps onto the goals of the Birmingham campaign, which is actually called Project C for confrontation, where they try to eliminate Jim Crow in just about every facet of life, from public accommodations to employment to education. I mean, it's a very, it's impressive the way in which thousands of people galvanized and had such an impact on every level in the United States. So, as we all know, President Kennedy was assassinated um, later that year, and then uh, President Johnson took up the cause and got the Civil Rights Act passed in 1964, and then the Voting Rights Act uh, passed in 1965, and that sort of now stands as the high watermark of progress in the civil rights movement, right? Um, and then all of a sudden, starting in 1966, things start to go in the other direction. Um, now, some of this has to do with King falling out with President Johnson over Vietnam, but you have on the one hand the, the uh, black power movement sort of rising up. This is what I write about in my latest book. Um, to challenge Dr. King and a lot of his, both his, his tactics and, and his strategy. And then, on the other hand, you have a backlash, a white backlash vote um, uh, that starts to manifest itself uh, in the 1966 election. So, so let's talk a little bit about, um, about all of that. So Dr. King, in the last three years of his life, Things changed dramatically from him, from the point of winning the Nobel Prize, the, the, you know, the, the great march from Selma to Montgomery, the passage of the Voting Rights uh, Bill in 1965, and his death in 1968. Can you talk both about how the challenges he faced changed and how it changed his, his mood and his sense of, of optimism about progress? It's a real turning point for King, and you know, we, I mentioned earlier that King didn't think of himself as a politician. A lot of his advisors, who were more politically focused, were saying, let's just keep doing what we're doing. Let's just keep pounding on the South, keep working on voting rights. We can tilt the balance of power in local elections, state elections, and Congress if we just keep getting more black people registered in the South, and that's where we're having our greatest impact, and King won't do it because he's not a politician, because he's a moral leader, because he's being guided by the Bible and by his deeply held religious beliefs. As he says over and over again, fundamentally, I'm a Baptist preacher. And he means it. He's not trying to be modest. He has to be reminded by Coretta that the Nobel Prize brings him greater power, that he can speak out on issues of poverty and income inequality and war, hunger. And he agrees, and he does. And that, unfortunately, has a back, even more backlash because a lot of the white people who have been supporting the movement in the North are not as interested in seeing their own communities criticized. They're not interested in having him come protest in Chicago in, or in LA or in Philadelphia. So the backlash really has a huge effect on him and affects his, his public 
uh, opinion ratings, you know, the Gallup polls, he's, he's falling and falling. Uh, we forget that in the last three years of his life, he was, he was, uh, he was disdained, um, that he was, he was seen as a, as a controversial figure and, and not a popular one at all. But he, he continues to persist with his beliefs. And there's one phone call, and we have a lot of, um, and I should give a shout out to the archivists here at the JFK Library. We have a lot of footage where we, in, in an audio tape where we can hear King. We can hear him in the Oval Office with John F. Kennedy right after the March on Washington. Uh, when Kennedy says, you know, it's Bull Connor who's done more for civil rights than anybody. Yeah. You know, like, what's King supposed to think about that comment? Um, you also hear Kennedy saying um, to the assembled group of African American leaders, um, tell your people to do more like the Jews and get themselves educated and lift themselves up. Don't wait for the government to do something for them. And, and Roy Wilkins talks back to Kennedy and says, you, know, you take care of your business, we'll take care of ours, Mr. President. Um, but what you also hear on a lot of these tapes is King's dismay, his, distre his distress. Um, he struggles emotionally, um, psychologically with the fact that he feels like no one's listening to him anymore in the last years of his life. So Tracy, uh, one of the things that happened, you know, very shortly after this speech, um, it had already happened with Malcolm X and others uh, even, even before then, is that within the black community, people started to question this whole dream of the great I have a dream speech goal of racial integration. Um, why was that? I think starting as early as July 64, when the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party goes up to the DNC in Atlantic City, and they lose their battle to unseat the regular Democratic Party. This is the, Party. Lou, the famous the Fannie Lou. The famous Fannie Lou H Hamer, Hamer speech. speech yes. on TV. And yes, before the Credentials right. Committee in 64. Yeah. And they lose that fight. And I think many of them expected to lose that fight to some degree. But they're dismayed by how those negotiations end up happening, right? They're offered two seats. They reject it. Um, this becomes a sort of a, this becomes a sore point for especially those youngsters who were in Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And then we jump to Selma in 65. And John Lewis speaks about this. He becomes a little, he becomes dismayed with King during the second march in um, 65. So there's three marches for Voting Rights Act in Selma. The first Bloody Sunday, which many of you probably are aware of with the images of protesters trying to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they are accosted by police officers on horseback, by dogs. I mean, it's just a very brutal, bloody affair. It's horrific, and it's all captured on television. The second march, they're going to try it again from go to Selma to Montgomery. And right before the march, a federal judge who's usually quite pro-civil rights has a, files an injunction and says that, signs an injunction and says that they can do the protest. Lyndon B. Johnson, King, and other politicians are very concerned, and they're, they're thinking, don't do the march. Right? King doesn't want to violate the federal injunction, but he understands that even if he doesn't go, the SNCC workers, Selma community, they're going to proceed without him. And so the day of the march comes. He crosses the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He gets to the end. He prays briefly, and he turns around. And this just upset so many student workers. Turn around Tuesday. Turn around, yep, turn around Tuesday. And I think they become very dismayed with King about, and they're thinking that things are going too slow. And come to find out behind the scenes, he's sort of done this face-saving compromise tactic, and they find out about that, and they're very much disillusioned. And then, you know, so this is March of 65, speed up to August, right? Watts riots happen. Right? This is an instance where a young boy in his 20s is pulled over by the police while he's driving and he's brutally beaten, right? another instance of police brutality. And you just have all of these instances, and that in particular, the Watts riots, also highlights the fact that the problem, the race problem, as Du Bois would call it, right, is not just a southern one, mm -hmm. it's a national one. And you have this group of young people who I think are just feeling like the progress is too slow. Right? And you've got this growing militancy at the same time from a lot of Vietnam vets who were coming back, who like those who came back after World War II, expecting to be treated as first-class citizens, only to be treated as second-class citizens once again. And they've got this new sense of urgency 
an anger or frustration. And I think it's just a, a bunch of factors combined that really breed this type of desire to find a new way to have a new vision, right? And I think in your book speaks to this too also about the rise of this black power sentiment, right? Stokely Carmichael makes the call in 66, but it's a sentiment that's already been going around for some time. He's just sort of popularizing this slogan. Um, and so there's an increased desire, especially among a younger generation, and SNCC considers himself to be a black power group, right? to be more focused on black political and economic empowerment, mm. to think about the psychological assertiveness of being blackness, to have cultural pride. And so this is, we're seeing that turning point happens well before 66, right? That some of that disillusionment and frustration starts in the summer of 64, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So David, you're writing about John Lewis now. He was very much caught up in this, in this shift um, uh, uh, in 65 and 66. Can you, t can you talk about uh, what happened to him and, and the effect it had on him. Yeah, a absolutely. And this is sort of the exact moment um, at which John Lewis really feels he has to leave SNCC along with many others. Uh, in 1966, it's a year after Selma, so we've had the Civil Rights Act passed. We've had the Voting Rights Act passed, these two grand accomplishments of the movement that people like John Lewis and all the ordinary protesters can take great pride in having uh, accomplished. Then, you know, there's a piece of the Kennedy speech we didn't hear, I don't think it was in the clip, where Kennedy talks about what today we would call systemic racism, perhaps. Mm -hmm. He talks about the disparities in health, in life expectancy, in education levels, in income uh, levels between black and white, and says that we have to figure out how to address this and equalize this too in society. So once you've tackled the legal remedies of Jim Crow, you know, getting rid of Jim Crow, desegregation, uh, voting rights, then how do you address these much more intractable economic issues, institutional issues? You don't have the same moral consensus in the nation. You can't galvanize white support so easily for your remedies. They're just there's much more uncertainty. And this also, I think, feeds into the split within SNCC. So within SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, some of them, like John Lewis, got into the movement through people who were part of King's group, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Nashville had a chapter, the Nashville Christian Leadership Conference, or, or uh, the C stood for something else at the local level. That's how John Lewis and Diane Nash and Bernard Lafayette and James Bevel, a lot of them get in. They stick to nonviolence. They stick close to King's vision. But there are a lot of other people in SNCC who come, say, out of Howard University. They tend to be Northerners, not Southerners. Significant difference there. Who all along have seen these economic inequalities as primary. And they're much more willing to go the black power route. So there's this dramatic meeting in 1966 when SNCC holds its elections. And John Lewis, despite you know, not really being with the zeitgeist, you know, he's clinging to this now seen as old fashioned Kingian vision of nonviolence. But there's a lot of affection for him and he wins re-election. And then after a lot of people have gone to bed and people think the meeting's adjourned, Someone comes in and demands a revote, and there's kind of chaos and consternation. What's happening? And make a long story short, late at night, the whole existing team of SNCC's leadership is voted out, and a whole new team is voted in. S within a few weeks, there's a march called the Meredith March, started by James Meredith, who integrated the University of Mississippi. Um, he's shot on that march, and then all these other folks come in to join the march. And that's where the chants of black power start one night and really get national attention. Within a few weeks, John Lewis realizes not only is he not chairman anymore, he can no longer be a part of this organization. Other people, Robert Moses, Julian Bond, many of the famous names we associate with SNCC choose in 1966 for one reason or another, 
the organization is just <coughs> headed into what they see as a more separatist, um, less concerned, you know, besides King, the other great mentor to Lewis was a man named Bayard Rustin, probably a name people know. Bayard Rustin always talked about interracial democracy and coalitions. He's the one who really put together the March on Washington. And so it was important that it be a movement, yes, black directed and led, as John Lewis always said, but also that involve the liberals, that involve Catholic groups, Jewish groups, labor groups, later environmental groups. But that vision of coalition politics um, was also one that John Lewis learned from Bayard Rustin that he felt the movement had to stick to, that he saw it abandoning, or at least SNCC abandoning around 1966. So a big factor that played in this shift and also that kind of fed what happened politically first starting in 1966 and then in 1968 with the election of Richard Nixon um, had, is remembered as um, uh, having to do with these, they called them riots, these summer riots. Harlem 64, Watts in 65, 66, and there was Atlanta, Chicago, went on Detroit in 67. If you go back, almost every one of those so-called riots, or rebellions as, there, as, as others like to call them now, started with an incident of police confrontation right. between the police and the black community. And going forward from that period on into the 70s and into the 80s, I think a lot of people would say that a big part of the story of why all the progress that seemed to be being made in 1963 under Kennedy and the early, and the early years of the, of the Johnson administration had to do quite specifically with relations between the police and the criminal justice system and the black community. So could you, it's a big subject, but right. can you talk about how you saw that? <laughs> well, the, by the... Because you were in the middle of it. You right. saw it all unfold on um, your watch. Right? I mean, the, the, in one sense, it's hard, it's hard to tell that story without telling Michelle Alexander's story about mm -hmm. uh, the new Jim Crow. Um, uh, it became possible to caricature the movement, not as a, move, a moral movement, not as a movement of integration, but as, and to put, and transform it into a discussion about crime. Um, the, the literature talks about the ways in which even Johnson's war on poverty uh, ultimately became the excuse for flooding uh, black communities with police. Uh, and when the, the, whenever the initiatives of the war on poverty began to falter, what you then had was an occupation, which we still have. Reagan is the first president to run on a tough on crime agenda. Nobody, I mean, Nixon. It, like, Nixon. Well, no, Reagan, I think it was also, yeah. but, but the, the notion that, that there could have been political uh, campaigns without a tough on crime mantra on the part of the Republicans we, we think is unthinkable, but in fact, it didn't begin to be a public issue until this time. Um, uh, the crime became the story of the evening news, crime became the story of uh, campaigns, and crime began to mask, the, the story about crime and tough on crime began to mask all of the, uh, all of the issues of the civil rights movement. It, it sort of changed the discussion so fundamentally, made worse by the 80s and 90s with the, the crime bill of Bill Clinton. So, that so the some, Democrats became part the of the Democrats, as well. Right, and to some degree what it did is it obfuscated everything. You no longer looked at why this was going on, what triggered the riots, or why you had, there was a brief spike in crime that then declined, but the, the, the whole criminal justice movement went totally retributive and began to mask uh, the kinds of issues that people had, had focused on uh, before. And I, I mean, I was a criminal defense and civil rights lawyer when this was happening. It, it hit its apogee <laughs> just when I became a judge. 1994, I, I go on the bench. And at that point, we are dealing with mandatory minimums of federal death penalty, uh, mandatory guidelines, um, which really, you can't put it any other way, obfuscated the real issues 
that had been so clear, or apparently so clear, in 63 and 64. And to some degree, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, too, because particularly once you felonize all of these crimes and so forth, um, you have entire communities that have a record that right. it comes very hard to escape and get even once they get out of prison to right. return to a normal but life. It, but it's, it stopped the conversation. Yeah. It was not a conversation about rights and fairness. It was completely a conversation uh, about crime. It, 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 it um, caricatured people. Um, I mean, we sort of see this even when the, when the press covers the latest shooting of a black man. You know, the, the narrative turns into what his record was. Mm -hmm. um, and it was this we translated all of these issues into crime issues. Um, that's, I'm writing about that now. I'm writing about the men that I sentenced, who the law caricatured, who the prosecutors caricatured, um, and for whom we could not see who they really were. Wow, look forward to that. So we promised to talk about then and now. <laughs> It, it seems like now seems a lot like then, <laughs> that we were, we're, we're, you know, we had a period uh, three years ago in the summer of 2020 in the wake of um, the murder of George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis, where there seemed to be, you know, a real sense of, of, of concern about all of these issues, of alliances, of, of blacks and whites, young and old out in the streets protesting for social justice. Um, and now, just a few years later, what are we talking about? We're talking about, you know, reversals of voting rights. We're talking about a war on black studies. We're talking about demonizing all of these, you know, buzzwords like critical race theory and, and so forth. Um, so let's talk a little, let's talk about, uh, about where we are today. So. Tracy, when you look, you look back at, given that historically anybody who has studied this history knows that we have these cycles of progress and backlash, do you think that the activists a few years ago, the Black Lives Matter and, and their allies and so forth, didn't plan sufficiently for what could have, what might have, they might have seemed to be a predictable backlash coming? Because yet again, you heard at that point yes. these things, you know, you heard it, you know, in the 60s, you heard it when, when Obama was elected president. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. Things are, are fundamentally different this time until they're not. I think the three women who started Black Lives Matter had an understanding of the history of the mm -hmm. black freedom struggle, mm -hmm. right? Not just the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. I think everything about this Black Lives Matter movement has been successful and it's significant for its ability to spotlight, to bring national attention to, to help families get justice, especially those who are victims of police brutality. Their ability to turn our attention to the economic dimensions of the civil rights movement, what remains to be done is important. I think they understood that the backlash was coming. I think they understood that we were in the midst, that we were about to hit a backlash, right? That the backlash was beginning with the murmurs of Obama not being a citizen. Yeah. Right. What I think is different, and I think historians, it's gonna take us a little bit of time to step back and reflect. We're a little slower in that <laughs> department, right? But I think what's different in this case, the height of the Black Lives Matter movement, at least in its current phase, was during COVID to my mind. And I think they, the movement did a remarkable job galvanizing people in the midst of a pandemic. I spoke as I was writing this current book, I was interviewing former SNCC members and they themselves felt a kinship with these Black Lives Matter activists that they were supportive of, even though they, them, they themselves couldn't get out in the street because of their age. But they saw themselves in that movement. I think the difference is, though, when Kennedy, for example, saw the children being brutalized in the streets of Birmingham, he acted. Right? When President Trump saw that happen, he agitated and he instigated. Right? The civil rights movement had an ally in the federal government, although sometimes the federal government was a reluctant ally, 
They were an ally, and the federal government benefited from the expansion of its powers during New Deal and World War II. And so they were able to have a different relationship with state governments. And they were willing to act on that. That's not what we see several years ago. And I think that's the difference. And you know, time will tell what they could have done differently. I think they also knew that they needed to not only think of themselves as a grassroots organization, but also to be corporate minded in a way, right? And so they've spent many thousands, millions of dollars donating to black education, donating to giving black students, supporting black students. There's a whole other wing of Black Lives Matter that we've tended to forget, or it doesn't fit the narrative of the right, right? But all of those things, I think, have been significant and are important. And I think when you're in the midst of a movement, it sometimes is difficult to foreshadow or understand or predict what could happen. You can just do your best to shift and make do. So, John, <laughs> Dr. King gets invoked a lot today in the midst of all of these struggles. On the one hand, you see the, the famous two Justins, the, the, the state legislators in, in Tennessee, uh, who protested over uh, gun legislation and then were ousted from the body along with their, their white colleague, um, talking about you know, carrying on the struggle of Dr. King. But on the other hand, you know, we expect that you know, as early as next week, sometime in the coming weeks, the Supreme Court will put an end to affirmative action and you will hear people on the right saying this is a fulfillment of King's talking about we should be judged by the color of our skin and not by the contents of our character. So one, when you hear that, having studied King now for the last five or six years, how do you respond to that? And also, is there a role for a modern version of a Dr. King, somebody coming out of the church, a more establishment figure who could somehow channel all of these forces. This or is seven you, or eight questions. Or do you, <laughs> or do you I'm acting as your lawyer here. Yeah, no, no. Thank you. Well, he's, he, you, he's, he knows how to answer because he's written a whole book about it, and I've read it. So. Well, uh, let me just use that question to say whatever the hell I want about yes. that. Yeah, please. <laughs> that's that's, that's what that's, that's And what I actually wanted to say when Tracy was talking is that there's a huge asterisk that we need to address when it comes to the Kennedys and the Johnsons acting as allies with Martin Luther King, and it hasn't come up yet in our conversation tonight, and that is the fact that the Kennedys authorized the wiretaps and the surveillance yes. of yes. Dr. King by the FBI, mm -hmm. and Johnson expanded it and um, really was a key ally of J. Edgar Hoover's in surveilling and attempting to damage um, and divide the civil rights movement. And that's something that really needs to be said because does relate to your question, and that is the way King has been used and by used and abused. When it's convenient to use him, he's an ally. When it's convenient to attack him, he's a foe. And all along, they knew what they were doing. All along, the Kennedys and Johnson knew that they were trying to work with King at the same time that their own administration was trying to destroy him, literally trying to destroy his marriage, um, sending a letter that suggested he, he, his only way out was suicide. And at one point, actually grooming a successor, the man that they wanted to take over as the head of the Civil Rights Movement if they could somehow push King aside. So King has always been used and abused, and, uh, and it continues today. And, and certainly those who say that King would be opposed to affirmative action um, would, uh, because he said that we should be judged by the content of our, of, of our character were not actually reading any of King's words or listening to any of his speeches. And um, you know, Kennedy, I think, for the, listened to one of King's speeches the first time um, at the March on Washington. He watched it on television from the White House and um, commented, wow, this guy's good. Mm -hmm. um, but it just goes to show that he wasn't really listening to the actual words. And that's where we are today. We are <laughs> cherry picking the words of King's that we want to use to support whatever cause we want to support whether it's the NRA or a mattress store having an MLK birthday sale, um, we are all using and abusing King and we're not going back and reading his actual words and listening to what he had to say. Uh, we're focused on I Have a Dream and not the first half of that speech which talked about police brutality and reparations. So um, that's my sermon. So David, you're also a political historian. So 
And we've talked a little bit about what happened in the 60s in response to uh, what was going on in civil rights, also Vietnam, with, uh, with Nixon and then, and, then, and then Reagan. Now we have a backlash against the progress um, of the last few years, represented by the governor of Florida now and others. Um, what, are the, what are the lessons here? I mean, is this just an inevitable kind of repeated cycle of American history, or is there a way of dealing with it this time that, that could, be, could move us forward? Well, you know, historians are, are, are better at the past yeah. than the, the <laughs> prognosticating the future. Um, look, I think, you know, on what's, you know, happening, say, in Florida or, you know, with Florida, we always point to, but in, in many, many states, there is, it's something more than a backlash, really. It is um, a kind of a new right-wing movement, you know, under the auspices of Donald Trump initially, and now under sort of the, the MAGA wing of the party, um, that really has taken um, kind of racial confrontation as a political weapon. I personally think they are wildly overplaying their hand. I think, you know, for many years, many decades since the 60s and 70s, there have been very legitimate debates, some voices on the right, some on the left, about, you know, where is affirmative action appropriate, where does it go too far, um, what kinds of remedies, you know, are, um, you know, valid, and what part do we sort of overemphasize race. These are kinds of questions that for a while, some in the Republican Party seem to be capable of um, arguing about in, in a reasonable way. Where Ron DeSantis and a lot of uh, the other uh, new figures on the scene are going, you know, outright bans, you can't teach this, and, and creating laws too that kind of give broad license for an individual discontented parent to file a check and have a whole book taken out of a library. You know, I, I don't think they even realize there is not a constituency for this. I mean, we still obviously have a long way to go in this country toward racial equality, but again, to sort of draw on John Lewis, he always, always pointed to how much progress had been made since the 60s, you know, and, and you know, he, here is a man who uh, would go into a certain town in, Alabama or Georgia and would have been ridden out of town on a rail back in 1960 and is now having the schools named after him and is being invited as a guest of honor. That, that there has been a sea change in, in attitudes, in laws, uh, in achievement, um, in closing of many disparities between black and white. Um, but rather than sort of um, sort of uh, accept that, I think this new right-wing movement is, is tapping to something like much older and much uglier and kind of even reviving neo-Confederate rhetoric. Um, but I don't think they're even a majority of the Republican Party. They just have, they have so, allowed so, microphones. So to some degree, does it reflect actually the fact that we, we have made the kind of progress that we had, that we're getting closer inevitably to a country where demographically minorities are going to be in the majority, and that the closer we get to that, the fiercer, perhaps smaller, but also fiercer the opposition to it. I, I, th I think that's a big part of it. I mean, I, I heard a statistic that from the nation's founding um, until 1992, Bill Clinton's first election, the percentage of the voting public, the electorate, that was white declined from something near 100 to 92 percent. Just since 1992 till today, it's gone from around 92 percent to something like 68 or 70 percent. There's a, a huge demographic shift in this country in the last 30 some years. And that is, I think, still something that a lot of people in a lot of parts of the country are grappling with, are, are threatened by, um, are trying to make sense of. Um, Obama's election represented both a triumph and a challenge. 
Um, you know, we could say even the same thing about Kamala Harris as, as vice president. These are real achievements. They, they, they symbolize something. They couldn't have happened in an America of, of a different era. Uh, and yet, they also make people uneasy. So I'm a journalist, so I like to be on the news. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, uh, before we go to the no, no, before we go to the Q and A, I want to end with Nancy um, uh, to talk about the Supreme Court because mm -hmm. they're they're handing down their rulings. Now we've had an interesting one on voting rights um, right. uh, this week. We're going to have affirmative action uh, in the coming weeks. Um, you're actually on. A, are you still on the commission, Biden's Commission's commission? Finished. With okay. Report. Okay, but that was actually. President Biden tasked you and some other distinguished jurists to actually look at the issue of the future of the Supreme Court. So I think that you know, people, a lot of people are very worried about the, the damage that this supermajority right wing supermajority court could do single handedly to a lot of the progress that's been made. What's your view of that? And, um, and, and do you think the court needs to be reformed or is it just a matter of sort of riding out this, oh, no. this current. Uh, let me start off. I mean, I think the court needs to be reformed. I think that um, uh, I was part of a rump group in the White House Commission that agitated for um, an, the argument that the court needed to be expanded. And part of it, there were three reasons for that. One was uh, while the counter was, you know, the Democrats would be packing the court, in fact, Trump packed the court by not uh, sitting on, by not allowing Merrick Garland's nomination to be heard, by squeezing in Amy Barrett's nomination when people were already voting, but more significantly by a series of decisions, this is part of the issue, in which they have validated thing, uh, uh, state provisions that are totally antithetical to free and fair voting. So that to some degree, the court's positions against gerrymandering, you know, not touching gerrymandering, leads essentially to a conservative majority that the, the Supreme Court is always out of sync with the society, right? It's because people are, you know, they're, they're life terms and they're always out of sync with whatever the political um, uh, movements are at the time. This is dramatically out of sync. This is a court in which an ultra conservative majority is baked in for, you know, my kids' generations and probably the generations after. And worse, this is a, an ultra-conservative majority that is, uh, that is dealing with impunity on so many levels and are anxious and breathless to undo. When Gorsuch was nominated, I wrote an op-ed which talked about the undoing project, that these were people who didn't believe in precedent and they were happily undoing what had been 50 years of precedent. So, I think something has to change. Then you add to that the issues with respect to Clarence Thomas, which are nothing short of astonishing. I mean, I never let anybody pay for me for coffee. I, mm. I now go back over my judicial career and I think what an idiot I was if I only knew <laughs> Harlan Crow. Um, what life would have been easier. But I, so I want to get back to what you said, though. So yes, I think the Supreme Court needs to be reformed, and I think we have to do something. And I think the discussions about reforming the Supreme Court and this is going out on a limb, may well have been responsible for the voting rights decision that you talked about. People t famously talk about Roosevelt when he was talking about packing the court. There was, you know, a stitch in time saves, a switch in time saves nine. I think that all of a sudden this was a court that realized it had to, it could not do, you know, 5,000 steps backwards and, and and leave it at that because there would be major legislation and there would be a back, you know, a real uh, a counter reaction. So I think that that's what was going on there. Um, uh, affirmative action is clearly going to be undone. John Roberts believes that the only way to end discrimination against blacks is to stop discriminating against blacks. Clarence Thomas has been sounding this theme for a while. They have, uh, they have the votes. But getting back to your point. Um, what I need a, a sociologist or a political scientist to tell me is, is this really the kind of backlash in the way that you described it, or is it a function of the media that gives that is an echo chamber, echo chamber to the Looney Tunes, to the wackadoodles? I mean, you you know, I'm a news junkie, and you watch it, and you think that the country is burning. Uh, it, it, it's really hard to understand how much of this is real and how much of this is. 
you know, just the, the media hyping it. Um, Trump clearly said the quiet part out loud. Trump clearly legitimized things that no one had ever uh, said before. But I, like you, believe they're, they're going a bridge too far. And that just as the left has a capacity to, you know, take, a, take things a step too far, I think that when there is really a meaningful vote in this country, DeSantis will be seen as the Looney Tunes that he is. Um, uh, and, and that, I mean, it doesn't mean that these attitudes are not baked in to a degree, but the kind of extremes that we're seeing, I cannot, you know, I want to go back and talk to polit two, uh, political scientists who talked about the McCarthy era, where, there, where McCarthy was doing, uh, accusing everyone of being a communist and undermining First Amendment rights. And then there was a point when somebody said, whoa, this is ridiculous. And things got undone rather quickly. Maybe I am naive, but I think we're going to reach that point. The question is when. OK, let's find out what's on the mind <laughs> of people in the audience. So uh, we're going to take questions now. I would just ask to ask questions <laughs> um, and, and, uh, since, and, and not just to make comments. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, going back to the uh, speech June 11, 1963, um, the spontaneity of the speech, and I think I heard that here that he, the speech wasn't, A, Kennedy was advised not to give it. There was some pushback maybe, perhaps. And so I didn't know the whole story that it was sitting on the shelf and then suddenly that was the moment to bring it forward. But also that he ran out of, the speech wasn't even to time. It was like a, a 15 minute time slot and by 12 minutes you can see if you watch the whole thing, he stops looking down at the desk and he's <laughs> just speaking direct to camera. So I'd just like to talk a little bit more about how you know, that element of it, how it was this spont spontaneous moment and how it all kicked in. Right, so, I mean, you're, you're right that uh, it was fairly spontaneous. They decided that day to give the speech. And he had, I'm forgetting if it was the day before or the day after, had another major speech on uh, the nuclear test ban treaty mm -hmm. and, and his peace speech at American University. Oh, okay. So he, he, it wasn't good politics, you know, media politics, to do two major speeches back to back. But they felt sort of compelled by the events of that day uh, in Alabama. I was trying before to remember the name of uh, Nicholas Katzenbach, who was the mm -hmm. attorney uh, general, right. assistant attorney general, who Bobby sends down to, to Alabama. Um, what, what they had decided on was, yes, we're going forward with a bill that it's finally time to introduce the big civil rights bill that we've been dithering about. So that, that part had been decided, but the speech hadn't been written. <laughs> and so that's where you get that sense of Kennedy is partly uh, reading and partly filling in from notes. I mean, the, you know, the basic ideas of what he was going to say were all there. But in some ways, I think it makes it, you know, as Mark's kind of offhand comment, you wouldn't know suggest in some ways I find it one of his most affecting speeches because when we speak spontaneously you know there tends to be that kind of feeling that comes through that when you're going strictly off a carefully calibrated script uh, you don't always convey so I, I don't know as, if that helps. as Dr. King would know right because yeah. that's the way right. he, he improvised right. I have he, a dream that's, that's right, right. That's he right. always just spoke from Notes, right? Yeah, and I think if you listen to the part that he improvises, you can hear echoes of Dr. King. Mm -hmm. You can tell that he was influenced by what he was hearing um, on TV from the civil rights activists. Yeah. But if I remember correctly, he expected to speak a lot more about the integration of the University of Alabama, but George Wallace, they registered that day, Vivian Malone and James Hood, and so that's in part oh, also had him switch up direction, is that right? Uh, you might be right. I don't mm -hmm. remember if, the, if that's the case, but yes, the, the thing worked out much better in Tuscaloosa than they would have dreamed. That basically Wallace totally gave in, but wanted some kind of face-saving thing where he could stand and give his little speech, mm -hmm. but then he would totally capitulate. So the Justice Department took that as a win. <laughs> so then when the 8 o'clock primetime speech rolls around, Alabama's kind of a settled yeah. matter, so it's really, there is more focus on the broad issues. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. 
Ma'am. Yes, I'd like to know if in a major utility within the Boston area has been discriminating against women that took the maternity policy, which we instituted in 1981. Is it beyond the scope of this? Because I look at it as it's just as important with gender equality as any black or white or green or whatever. So I was wondering, where do we go? We've tried everything. My friend is in, very involved in it, and she's kind of shy. So I got up, and I'd like to know who can help us. I, I agree with you. It's not really the subject of this panel. So right. I don't know if there's anybody in the audience who perhaps afterwards could seek you out to talk to you about that. I would um, appreciate it more than you know. We've been okay. trying for a long yeah. time. So if anybody, please, please do. Ma'am, over here. Good evening. I am the online representative. So I have two questions for you, if that's OK. Kennedy and Johnson put through a comprehensive civil rights program. Both agreed that or that was the end of the Democratic Party in the South, maybe the end of the Democratic Party winning presidential elections. Can you speak on the courage that they displayed in doing that? And second, can Judge Gertner weigh in on where we are today vis-a-vis -vis the accomplishments of the 64 Civil Rights Act and the 65 Voting Rights Act, especially in light of recent SCOTUS decisions? <laughs> Nancy, do you want to start with the second, and then we'll go? Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. When we were talking be, uh, before this about the backlash to the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, um, I mean, I spent my career litigating the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, that birthed uh, a movement to deal with discrimination in jobs, uh, that birthed a movement to deal with discrimination in public accommodations, that occupied I, almost 50% of my docket as a federal judge and uh, almost 80% you know, of my practice as a lawyer before I became a judge. So, and that's still in place. Cut back to be sure, um, cut back to be sure and, and narrowed, um, but as a statement that we stand for uh, you know, non-discrimination in the workplace and public accommodations, and even in universities, you have to understand the affirmative action issue doesn't undo the, the underlying discrimination laws. So voting rights is a different issue. Voting rights has been substantially narrowed by this court, but they have not yet done violence as perhaps they're capable of to, the, to discrimination cases under the Civil Rights Act. And, you know, the, you, the, we talk about the 64 Civil Rights Act, this, the other remarkable, amazing, astonishing achievement of this period was Title IX. Yeah. Uh, Title IX may well be the single most extraordinary thing that the second wave women's movement mm -hmm. uh, accomplished, and that is still in place. So when you talk about the backlash, it can only go so far. So the, the, so the first part of the question was, did you know, Johnson famously or said or you know, that he might be losing the South, but that's, so clearly there, there was a ship there, but to talk about right. how that's I mean, played there's, out. There's, look, there's a general truth to it. Of course, they knew that in doing this much for African Americans, that was gonna help them with the African American vote, which was already trending Democratic, and hurt them with the white conservatives Southern, not only Southern, but Southern vote. But it's, it's also too neat a narrative that I think sometimes we hear in the media that, you know, after 1964, boom, it's over for Democrats in the South. Again, to go to John Lewis, who I'm writing about, between 1970 and 1976, he leads a group called the Voter Education Project. He was kind of like the Stacey Abrams of his day going around all 11 states of the old Confederacy, getting blacks to register to vote now that they could do so without fear and could do so legally. Um, something like two and a half million blacks get registered to vote. When Jimmy Carter wins the presidency in 1976, with a very different electoral map from what you see today, winning most of the South, and winning most of the South on a combination of lots and lots of black votes plus white, liberal, and moderate Southern votes. That's a new recipe. So that kind of refuted what 
LBJ said, Bill Clinton won Georgia, won Louisiana, won Arkansas. Won. So it's, it's just not quite that simple. Even Joe Biden won Georgia. Um, now, of course, the general outlines are true that the sort of more retrograde, you know, old fashioned white supremacist politics are more tenacious in the South and help Republicans. But I don't think it's deterministic. I don't think it means that Democrats can't speak to white Southern or rural voters. They just need to find um, policies and, and, and language and approaches and uh, to do so and candidates. Right. Sure. Oh, uh, wow. What a marvelous panel. Thank you so much. You, you laid out so much. But the, there's a lot to unpack in all of this, and we can't do it in an hour. I would like to say first that I've never met a bigot that was, I've never met an individual that was born a bigot. It has to be taught. And until we, and especially you who are earnestly following this, can find a way to get rid of this stuff. I would like to see all of this end in my lifetime. Because I've been, I remember Kennedy's speech. I remember when Kennedy was shot. I remember Johnson's war on poverty. I remember walking not too long ago with Black Lives Matter. The, this question I have is, do any of you or all of you have any thought of the timing when we can finally get around to realizing that all people are inherently equal? Well, <laughs> that's Surprise. a big question. No, no, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a big question, but I mean, actually I would go to, you know, first to John and, and then to Tracy on that because that is really what King, in the midst of all the, you know, political dramas that, you know, of the day, that he kept his focus on. Yeah. And then today, you know, for a younger generation, they're still sort of wrestling with that. So could you talk about if, it, did you foresee us ever getting back to a day where that becomes what we're talking about rather well, than all this partisan? Well, King always said that the time for justice is always now, you know, and, and that the amazing thing is that he never lost hope despite all of the, the negativity, despite the public and, his, and the government turning on him, despite, you know, his diminishing popularity and his um, damaged relationship with LBJ. He, he never lost hope and he was only really committing more and, and more deeply. Uh, so I think it's worth remembering that despite the mounting odds against him, he, he, never, he never quit and his, what was his last his last uh, activist movement was to create the Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C., which was to go beyond civil rights and to look at human rights, to look at a way that we can really fundamentally change the approach to economics and justice in this country. And his plan was to occupy Washington, essentially. Mm -hmm. To stay there with the, an encampment within view of the White House and the Capitol until mm -hmm. his demands were met, until we really thought deeply about the societal issues at the core at the, the moral rot at the core of American society, as he called it. So um, I think as long as you, you know, all we can do is, is try to have that same sense of hope and purpose that he had right up until the end. And Tracy, when you study the younger generation these days coming up, I mean, what do you think? Are they, you know, get, to yeah. get Nancy's, first of all, are, are, are it's where they're coming from reflected in the news coverage to begin with? And also, do you yeah. think that they are as, partisan and divided as we all talk about? Or do you think that, that under this n new generation as they get into positions that we'll see things coming back to more of these broad discussions about I hope so. I have to say, when I, you asked the question, I immediately thought of my students mm -hmm. who are just, have, are just more savvy and sophisticated in understanding racial democracy, racial capitalism, its long-term effects. They are much more engaged in activism than I think we give them credit for. I too. Yeah, I just think that I am, I am hopeful because of them. I think if I was isolated just writing my book, I might have a very different answer. Mm -hmm. um, but they have a different mindset and they have a different intention on how they want to live their lives. Mm 
how they move throughout the workplace, how they move throughout educational institutions. And so I think it's promising. Now, will it happen in my lifetime? Maybe not. But I am hopeful that perhaps that we'll see great strides, at least in my daughter's lifetime. I should say she's like two, so <laughs> so give it some time. But yes, <laughs> can it be a little faster than that? <laughs> so my, my students are like that as well, um, and uh, you, they they are totally disconnected from the out from the narrative that you see on television. They're totally disconnected, and Black Lives Matter moved them fundamentally in in every class in every way. Um, you can't teach criminal law any longer without coming to grips with systemic racism yeah. issues. It's just, I, I mean, it may be Harvard, but I, I think it's more general than that. So yeah, I think it made a difference. I mean, you see it in lots of areas. I mean, gay rights issues are yeah. fundamental to this generation. It's not an issue. Uh, and so I, I, that, that's part of my sense of a disconnect. Yeah. Um, if they vote is another question. Um, yes. their, their disconnect from the, from the national narrative may just leave them not voting, right. which is a problem. Yeah. I'll just say, John Lewis always used this phrase, laying down the burden of race. And he always talked about, you always believe the day will come where we will, so it's, it's not quite the same as not seeing color, but it is saying it will, it will cease to matter. It will cease to matter in how we treat each other and those kinds of things. Um, when will that day come? You know, I don't think anyone I'm betting on your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but I also think that, our, that generation respects the color, right? And they respect the history that is attached to color. And I think until right. we're willing to do that in every facet and, it, and acknowledge what this has done historically and what this currently, how it has shaped current people's identities and experiences, we can't get to that place about without color. And frankly, I find beauty in the color as a black woman. And so I'm not sure that I want to live a day where we don't see color, but rather that you see me and t treat me as a first class citizen. Yeah. Well said. Sir. Um, to echo, sorry. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, great panel. Uh, this question touches on a lot, so I'll try to narrow it down. Uh, your line about JFK, what he said about Bull Connor and his effect on civil rights got me thinking that, at least within my lifetime, a lot of the precursors to movement and awareness have been suffering. It's been body cam footage, it's been George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Rodney King. And I'm wondering, is there a way or do you foresee a way, knowing that it's difficult to kind of predict the future, for that to change, where, you know, the arguments made and the movements will be enough, where people don't have to gain sympathy because the flip side of patience and waiting for the right thing to happen, whether it's in our lifetime, your daughter's lifetime, or beyond that, is that while that is happening and people are waiting, there will be violence, there will be a cost. And it's one thing to say that, you know, we just have to wait, but if you're the person who is losing somebody close to you or losing your own life in that, you would not say that's a worthwhile cost. And it's kind of hard, like I, in my 20s, I was more of an idealist, now I'm realistic to what the situation is. And you touched on it with the media and how the media is going to cover certain things and frame it. So without having that ability, without activists having the option to write legislation themselves, how does someone become okay with that being the price and hoping that, you know, well, there may be lives lost, maybe people hurt, and hopefully generations from now, it'll work out in the end. It's a hard pill to swallow. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, John, you talked about it, and, and you know how much deliberately. I mean, King and other civil rights leaders were, in some ways, even provoking crisis in order to sort of move things along. So I guess the broader question is, will we always be driven in all of this stuff by the crisis of the moment and have to sort of seize on that? Yeah, you well, know, King often said that you know unearned suffering was redemptive. And that didn't go down easily with people who were suffering. But his uh, point was that we would show our moral superiority, that we were willing to suffer because we loved our country and we loved our brothers so much um, that we were still willing to open our hearts to the people who had mistreated us so badly for so long. And he was aware that you know, his, his words rang louder when he was in prison. 
He was aware that fire hoses and Bull Connor had an impact on public policy. And that's a bitter, bitter truth. Mm -hmm. And um, as your question suggests, you know, how much more abuse do we need to take to move forward? Uh, haven't we gotten the message yet by now? How many you know, generations have to suffer before we get the idea that we shouldn't be treating people this way? And the answer is, I don't know. But it's, but it's, a, it's a kind of a universal truth that you've touched on. Do we have another online? Yes, we do. What similarities are there between the civil rights struggle the trans community is facing today in the form of health care restrictions at the state level and the civil rights struggle of the 1960s? Sorry, again, that's about the similarities between health care? Health care for trans individuals and the Oh, 1960s. for trans individuals. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, Nancy, you talked about that. I mean, that, that in a way, that's for a lot of young people, it's the oh, yeah. civil rights issue or one of right. them of the day? I mean, I think um, it, it goes to what we were saying before. So are the kinds of retrograde um, legislation and policies that we're seeing in Florida and across the country, is that a bridge too far? Will they have gone too far? Or, or you know, and will the next generation, the, my kids' generation, my students' generation, who have no patience with this at all? Um, will there be a, that kind of reaction? And I think that there is. I mean, this is all intuitive. Because one of the things that is extraordinary, for example, is how easily gay marriage went down. Uh, in a very short time, we went from one decision, a Supreme Court decision, to almost a sense of, of course. Uh, trans issues are testing that to a degree, but I think that there's a bedrock uh, and I do think this is a bridge too far. I think that there's a, um, a lunacy about this, and they've just out, because they're talking to one another and because they have power, I think they're ignoring the electorate, And because I don't think the electorate is where they are. Oh, hi. Um, I would like to thank you very much to be here in Boston and giving us all the opportunity to learn a little more and be uh, for almost an hour and a half, uh, listen about what happened in the past and how the past is gonna influence the children in the future. Um, I would like to know you gentlemen here near the lady lawyer, yeah. Um, I would like to know um, what book of yours take more time to do research? How long time take so I can just buy it? <laughs> oh. Well, thank you for the, that question. Um, this book took me six years to do, uh, to write, research and write. I'm so glad to hear that. And um, I don't do anything else. I don't teach, except I try to pay a little attention to my family. Um, but other than that, this is a full time, this is it. So six years of, of nonstop work uh, just, to, just for, for this book. And, and, and I could have spent another six years happily and still find more archival material, still find people to talk to, um, and still find it fascinating. So this, this King's life is, is extremely rich. And um, I, I've, I've enjoyed and felt blessed to have the opportunity to spend that much time researching him. Again, thank you so much you. for you guys being here today. You made my time. Thank you. OK, I think we have time for just a couple more questions, sir. Um, as the son of an army officer and a, a fellow news junkie, Your Honor, um, <laughs> there was a lot of debate in the 60s about blacks going in, into the military, even though that was their, their path to the middle class, given the Vietnam War. And the Vietnam War was our first televised war, essentially. What I want to know is when did King, Dr. King start to, um, when, did, when did Vietnam become, come across his radar screen? You know, and when did he start dealing with it? And also, did he have anything to say about the number of black men that were going into uh, having to go through the, um, uh, you know, when you were, uh, because of the draft? Uh, was there any comments from him about that? Yeah, as, as my other subject of a biography, Muhammad Ali pointed out, um, 
he was not just a, Ali, this I'm, I'm talking about, was not just opposed to the war uh, on, on religious principle. He was opposed to it because black young men were being disproportionately drafted and killed, um, increasingly uh, disproportionately assigned to the front lines, uh, especially in the early years of that war. And, and it, it, King begins to mention it in the early 60s, 63, 64. And um, after he wins the Nobel Prize, and again, props to Coretta here, it's Coretta who says, mm -hmm. We, not you, we now have a greater responsibility than ever to speak out on international issues, including the war in Vietnam. And King becomes, begins speaking out more and more um, on, on the Vietnam War, even as early as 64, 65. And, and Coretta, too, Coretta's out there uh, speaking at, at anti war rallies um, and, and really um, at, moment, at times when King's advisors are uh, urging him to avoid the spotlight on this issue because they're afraid it will hurt his relationship with LBJ. King says, well, maybe Coretta can give that speech instead of me. But after a little while, she's, she's pulling him in, and he's, he's morally compelled to, to go all in, uh, by, certainly by 65, 66. Can I add one um, irony here? You know, we, we tend to sort of, uh, because the Vietnam War has not, say, held up well uh, in the light of history, we, we, we tend to admire King and others who did turn their focus and kind of resisted that political pressure, don't, don't get involved in this other controversial issue. There was, however, a flip side of it. You know, we were talking about, well, why does the civil rights movement after the mid-60s kind of lose steam and sort of cease to attract the excitement and energies of young people? Well, one reason is they're protesting Vietnam instead. Now, sometimes people could connect their analyses and intellectually, yeah, but the nature of the rallies, the nature of the fundraising, the, na the, the whole focus of the media was now on Vietnam. And I think some people like John Lewis sa said this at the time, because uh, oh, he was actually out in front opposing the Vietnam War even before King. Um, but he did see that in some ways it was more kind of tragedy than blame. You know, there, there was a loss here, a loss of energy going into the civil rights fight. That's a really good point. It's also worth remembering that the war was still quite popular uh, when, right. when John Lewis and, and even King were beginning to speak out against it. Right. I mean, but also there's the shift to black power, right? So there's got a large number of people who are shifting their attention to the Black Panthers who are in alliance with the student radical movements right. and right. anti-war. And also, we also forget that the work that it takes to be a civil rights activist is exhausting. And so a lot of them are just tired, right? Some of them have just gone and settled in Ghana and other places in right. Africa. Go off to graduate school. Go off to graduate school. <laughs> I mean, the type of psychological and physical toll of being an activist day in and day out and breathing that in and eating it is like going to Vietnam War. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, actually, um, Gene Roberts, who was the chief uh, reporter for the New York Times, in, uh, in the Deep South uh, in 1965, 1966, was made Saigon bureau chief. In, in early 1968, I interviewed him for my book, and he said it wasn't until he got to Vietnam that he understood the psychological impact that organizing in the Deep South and the kind of you know, Ku Klux Klan infested, you know, really violent Deep South yeah. had had on the SNCC generation. Yeah of organizers, yeah. that there was a real trauma involved. John Lewis actually had a proposal that you should be able to fulfill your draft, your military service, by going and joining SNCC or SCLC <laughs> or doing civil rights work in the South. He said, that should count as national service. Right. <laughs> but it's true. I think that's still a good idea. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. It's a very good idea. I'll yeah. second that. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question, ma'am. Hi, so I'll make this quick. But, um, so I would say I'm part of the younger generation that you guys are talking about. I'm freshly 21. Um, and since high school, I was part of the Black Lives Matter activism in my local city, my local town, and going into college as well. And that's what brought me here. Uh, and I heard you talking about you have students of your own um, up here on the panel. And I wanted to say I agree that there is a disconnect between the younger generation and the older generation. Uh, on how we get our media and how we get our information through the media. Um, 
I definitely, I see it with my own mom, um, who is 65. So I see that she gets the media from TV and other such, while I would agree that my generation just does not really listen to that. Um, and I was wondering if you see a connection on how to um, give some advice in this kind of complicated world on how to kind of mend that disconnect and kind of find a way for each other to t talk to you know talk to each other and discuss because I think that that disconnect is kind of halting this progress that we we've, you guys have talked about. I imagine you're doing some of the work already, right? <laughs> the type of conversations you're having with your parents, yes, are necessary, right? Because your your mother is probably a little younger than my mother, <clears throat> and social media is not her thing. <laughs> Not she does not have a Twitter mom. handle, right? No, no, no. But I think it's about having those conversations with myself, with some of my cousins, that make her think about what she's hearing, let's say, on MSNBC News, mm -hmm. through a different vantage point, right? Yeah. So I think that's some of the work that you're doing. I think it's difficult. I think the reason why Black Lives Matter worked and was so successful was because you were able to have these conversations on the internet mm -hmm. and galvanize people in a variety of places who ordinarily would not be sitting in the same room together. But then what's lost is that you're not sitting in the same room together like you would be in the civil rights movement, right? So there's something yes. about the very act of making flyers together and having those sort of late night conversations right. that are important in shaping the nature and the direction of a movement. But I think you're on to, I think the first step is having those conversations, right? And the two of you sharing what you know. Mm -hmm. I think that's important in sort of to creating an intergenerational movement that was exactly what the civil rights movement was. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would also say, and this is a piece of advice I give in mm -hmm. different contexts, that we should all be doing more consumption of media that we know offers opinions, viewpoints, politics, generational perspectives that aren't our own. That, you know, if we want others to try to be more sympathetic to our points of view, we also ourselves have to do the exact same thing and try to become more sympathetic or at least understanding of their points of view. Because, I mean, I, I do read some right-wing media and then I read left-wing media and I see that they often distort you know, the best face of the right wing or conservative position um, and, and vice versa. And, you know, unless we really try empathetically to enter into the minds of those who are on the opposite sides of the divides from us, I don't think we're ever going we're, we're gonna to make much progress. I think we have to end it there, but. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to thank, first of all, the JFK Library for having us. Or Alan, if he's still here. Um, and uh, I want to thank the panel. But most of all, I want to thank, thank the audience here and online for all your great questions. And um, thanks, thanks to all for the rest of the evening. And here's your pen. Oh, no, that's not one.